essentially sources of funds. Now we so we continue with commercial banking four, which uh, is the last and hopefully very uh, short. The question was, what is a uh, what is a repo? It meaning how does it really work? What does it really mean? All right, so repo is a repurchase agreement. You got party A, which will be me, and party B, which will be you. I will have securities worth $105,000, all right, and I will give you the securities for $105,000 of market value, and you will give me an amount of money for one month of $99,000. So, we call the loan over collateralized. Uh, if you got girls, you know, why don't you just stop? You know, just stop, finish your job. Mm -hmm. No, 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 we finish your job, do whatever you want to do, and then we finish our job here. You can't do three things at the same time. So, 99,000 is the loan, is over collateralized. So, give me 99,000 and I give you 105, all right? Well, the next time around, one month later, so today, uh, let's call it time, time zero, and then you have time 30. At time zero, there is uh, 99,000. This is the cash flow, all right? And at time 30, the cash flow is, in this particular case, will be plus 99, and it will be minus... 105. No, 100. 100. I'll explain this part. So, essentially, the, uh, what I did was I sold the securities to you for $99,000, and you gave me cash $99,000. And we arrange beforehand that 30 days from today, I will buy them back at 100. So 30 days later, I will give you 100,000. So essentially, what happened was you gave me 99, in return got back 99, which was the original principal, plus one, which was your interest, okay. your income, your return. So essentially you got one out of 99, approximately in this deal, the way I did it, you got 1% for 30 days, so a non-compound basis, you got 12% return. Well, but the value is 105. Why 105? The answer is to provide me with the incentive to come up with the thousand and give it back to you. Because if I don't give it back to you, you forfeit the securities. And when you forfeit the securities, no, you get to keep the 105, all right? So, in other words, if I don't come up with the money, I'm suffering a huge loss. I'm suffering the loss, which is the difference from 100 to 105. So I've got a huge incentive to come up with the 100. And that's it. So, essentially, what I, the over-collateralization serves as a super strong incentive to return back the loan, all right? Well, remember, it wasn't even a loan. It was originally a sale, so you own securities at a uh, value market. So, so it has a very low risk of the Yeah, we, well, we has no, no risk, risk no they're risk, they're because you already have them and you already own them. There is not even a repossession risk. There is no legal risk. There is no, you already own them. So the this is extremely low risk. Okay. Yeah, but in the book, the example was uh, between banks and even though, for example, GE has extra money and they will lend it to the, ba uh, Correct. Money to the bank. Correct. And then the bank will give it to them uh, with interest. Correct. But this is money. It's not a security. Where's the security? Mm -hmm. Where's the collateral? No, no, no. Collateral. With a, Repo, a repo will be always secured with, with 
high grade securities, usually treasuries, usually treasuries. So what will happen is GM will have one million extra. So they'll buy T bills. Uh, yes, they will technically buy the T-bills from the bank, so the bank will technically borrow the money for a short while, and then the T-bills will go back to the bank, the T-bills. So this is the same as the bank is buying liquidity from GM, and is using the T-bills as a collateral. Now, the repo essentially has the nature of a secured loan secured loan where the securities that were sold and bought will act as a collateral securing the loan. Alright, does this make any sense? So, a repo is a transaction between any two. You gotta understand, very common, extremely common transaction is a repo between a central bank and, and a commercial bank. bank. It is very common between two commercial banks. It is very common between a commercial bank and a big corporate customer. So the repo is just the transaction of actually selling the securities and buying them at a stipulated time later for a stipulated price. Seven days later at this higher price. All right. And usually a repo will include some round, but not always, round numbers, 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, especially when it's between big institutions. Is this kind of clear? Yeah. All right, uh, we, mm -hmm. more questions. Yeah. Uh, they always use in the bank repo rate, reverse repo rate. Yes, there is a repo rate, or there is a reverse repo rate. So, repo rate is the rate. yield, the yield that the selling and then buyback will provide to the one party and that's the yield so so you have a repo and then you have a reverse repo so when a executes a repo with b b has executed a reverse repo with a so on any two parties that in, uh, that execute a repo for the one always is the repo, and for the other one is always the reverse. So the rate of lending and the rate of borrowing. This is the rate of lending and the rate of borrowing. There may be some difference by cost, commissions, and other things, but ideally, it should be the same. Okay. Uh, 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 again, it also depends. Now, it also depends who the borrower is and who the lender is. So, you mean the repo rate What's will? Between the central bank and the bank. In a commercial bank, yeah, usually commercial. for the management of liquidity, for satisfying minimum reserve requirements. I don't want to get into the details of who, how, and why uses repo deals. For this, you study financial instruments, right? We're still trying to focus on financial institutions. All right, so the last piece, big, is a whole big section of its own, which is called off balance sheet activities off balance off balance sheet operations or off balance sheet activities uh, bankers love these because they usually do not show have to well they don't show on the balance sheet they don't show fundamental weakness and usually they don't have to set aside either liquidity or meaning reserves or they don't have to set aside capital for some of these trans for some of these transactions. So if bankers can make it off balance sheet, they'll try to do it. Is there yeah, a they question? Always, they always do it. It's like contingent funds, right? Yeah. Uh, well. The contingent funds doesn't go inside the balance sheet. This is what I'm going to be explaining over the next oh, okay. 15 minutes. That's what I'm going to be doing. And the one thing you would call, uh, so the big one is loan commitments. So a loan commitment will be, in this case, a contingent liability. So this is a commitment by the bank to provide a loan 
at a future date, maybe six months from now, maybe two years from now. So it will have to have the liquidity. It must have it available, but not today. And when you make the commitment today, but it will be six months from today, somehow this, uh, this commitment creates a liability, but it creates a future liability, all right? Now, the liability future, the future liability may be firm or it may be contingent. Firm means it shall happen six months from now no matter what. The contingent is it may happen, it may not happen. Uh, customer with a firm uh, commitment will be a construction company which uses tranches. You know what's a tranche or tranches? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a partial payment on a loan by the lender to the borrower. You're going to be building uh, this building when you dig the foundation and you pour the concrete foundations and you got a firm concrete foundation. Uh, we will pay you another 20% of the loan. So, they will provide a 20% tranche for building the foundation. When they build the foundation, then the bank will say, we'll give you 30% to build it up to the roof. So, they give a second tranche of 30%. The construction company builds the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, up to the roof, all right? Now, the borrower has utilized 50% of the loan. And then, they'll need another 50% to put the windows, put the doors, the security, electricity, plumbing, and, you know, lights, whatever else will be needed. Because construction is not just concrete, bricks, and glass. It's way more than that, all right? I mean, electricity, security, plumbing, all. So, then they will be taken by trash as well. When you're a construction company that will need five million to build a hotel, you definitely don't want to get only one million loan, build the foundation, and then be stuck that you might not be able to get the loan, right? That will be a disaster, financial disaster. What you want to do is you want to make sure they want to commit the bank no matter what that they'll. You know, as long as you did your part, meaning you completed the foundation, which is good, then the bank will give you the second and the third tranches to continue with the construction. All right? Mm -hmm. So these are the commitments, and these represent the, the loan commitment. So the loan commitment actually is an obligation by the bank to provide a specified loan amount to a particular firm, and here is the key, upon request, upon request. And upon request means contingent, contingent. But why is it considered off balance sheet if they're giving the money it's funded? No, the answer is a loan commitment is not giving the money. Uh, a loan commitment a is a promise that I will give you one million whenever you come and request. If you come to me and request, then, it's in the balance sheet. then it becomes an actual transaction and it goes on the balance sheet. But the commitment is just a promise. So the promise is I will give. Of course, you're going to give me a commitment fee for that because I'm not going to commit uh, to give you a million for nothing. You know, why would I do that? Why would it be what we call tie up liquidity? I mean, uh, if instead of tying up liquidity, I'd rather actually use it and earn money in the meantime. So, of course, it won't be coming for free. But the point is that it is just a promise. Anytime you come to me for the next 60 days or by the end of this year, uh, I'll, you know, allow, I'll loan you up to $1 million. So, upon request. So, this creates a contingent liability because the customer may come or may not come. In other words, the customer effectively gets a call option. And when he gets a call option,
the commitment fee represents the option premium, all right? In order to get the option premium, essentially you commit the funds and if the customer executes, then you will effectively put it on the box, all right? Uh, all right, let's do this one time, and this is where the textbook is uh, clarifying, is the so-called note issuance facility. Note issuance facility. Let's, I will use the red one, note issuance facility. So, note issuance facility. It is a, again, a facility. The facility is in the form of a commitment. The commitment to buy up or buy out commercial paper. So now you know why we studied commercial paper, right? Which is a security issued by a business commercial to finance business. commercial business to finance its operation. So what a commercial business will do, it will decide or try to when it needs five to ten million of uh, funds, it will try to issue commercial paper and if it issues it and sells it okay within specified limits, in other words the paper will yield within between, let's say, I'm just making numbers, five and seven percent for up to seven percent, then the issuance is considered successful, all right? But if the issue fails means they cannot sell it on the market for seven or less or they cannot sell it on the market for the full amount of, I don't know, 10 million or 50 million or 100 million, then the bank has made the commitment to buy out the rest, the balance. So they try to sell, let's say, 50 million, they're able to sell only 27, the bank will make up the difference of 23. The difference of 23 will be a straightforward purchase of those securities at the predefined, let's say in this case will be 7% uh, yield, could be 7.5% yield, and this represents a commitment by the bank to buy out or finance the company. In this case, technically it's not a loan, technically it is... <laughs> They're locked. <laughs> to help themselves. That is purchasing the security. Purchasing the security. It's not a loan. You know, loan is this is buying the instrument. What's the difference between the loan and the security? The security is tradable. The bank could potentially later sell it when market conditions improve. So the bank buys the commercial paper and owns not a loan, owns a commercial paper on a commercial enterprise. So three days later, the bank could sell it to a third party. It's a negotiable instrument. The loan is not quite really a negotiable instrument. On a negotiable instrument, when the corporation like IBM was out, it may have an active secondary market on that commercial paper. So the bank will be able to observe the market and when it sees the market becomes favorable, they may place or sell some of that paper on the secondary market. If it's a straight loan, the bank will have to negotiate with a, another banker. In other words, loans by their nature are not liquid. With the commercial paper, you may have the opportunity or actually a secondary market that will be liquid and that you can sell it a little later, two days or 20 days later. All right? Number two, standby letters of credit. Two, standby letters of All right, so what is the letter of credit? Any distant memory? Uh, the letter of credit is uh, the bank is issues a letter of credit. Okay, the bank. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like between two a trader and a uh, company. Okay, the, the company. trader we call seller, seller, 
And the other one we call a buyer. Okay, so the bank. Uh, they don't trust each other. They don't. Uh, oh, the buyer and seller don't trust each other. So they bring in the bank to, to make sure the payment will be done. Okay, so they bring in the bank where the bank will guarantee that in case the one party satisfies its part of the deal, and of course the other party satisfies the part of the deal, the bank begins to work a little bit as a trustee, where both parties trust. In Bulgaria, we have a buyer and a seller, of course, it's practically everywhere in the world, so let's say real estate, both parties go to the notary, and the public notary will act as a trustee. Each party will you know, know that when they put the money up, whether it's deposit or the front payment or the first payment or the full amount or whatever that might be, notary will not back out. The notary will provide his part trustfully, all right? Because he acts in the interest of the, presumably in the interest of the public. Well, in this particular case, the bank will act in the interest of the customers. And of course, for a fee, right? Yeah. <laughs> Bankers don't do those things, sir. All right. Uh, in this particular case, the bank, we say, backs an obligation. So it's a backing or a guarantee, guarantee of, of uh, let's call it the bigger word, obligation. Obligation. So it might be even in the form when the letter of credit, uh, uh, when the bank issues a letter of credit to the corporate customer, the corporate customer will usually use the letter of credit, he will buy the goods and he will owe the money, let's say, within 60 days. And, and within 60 days he will have the obligation to pay to his seller according to the sale. And within 60 days, if you, meaning he doesn't pay and defaults on the payment, then the bank assumes the obligation. It becomes now, according to the letter of credit, it becomes now the bank's obligation to cover the funds to the seller. And then the bank will have a separate obligation to recover its uh, funds from its customer. All right? So essentially, the letter of credit is essentially a bank guarantee to its customer for a specific obligation that if the customer does not satisfy its obligation to a third party, the bank will take full responsibility. So suddenly, the bank lends its creditworthiness to the customer because the customer may be small and might not have good well-established credit worthiness on the market but yet if the customer has been a customer of the bank for the last 10 or 20 years the bank knows the customer really well to the point of trusting him for that particular loan all right the third one will be uh, forward contracts and they don't really specify it explicitly, but uh, I will because that's usually the most common one. The textbook just says forward contracts, correct? It says uh, on ours, forward contracts on currencies. Ah, okay, forward contracts. My older edition simply says forward contracts and the text explains that it is a forward contract on a currency so actually becomes becomes currency forward currency forward well currency forward is an obligation by the bank to make a future exchange transaction in other words to exchange one particular currency for another at a predetermined exchange rate. And the exchange rate is fixed today to make the transaction three, six, nine months 
whatever from today. All right? So this exchange transaction represents a liability. Now, in this particular case, the liability is not a contingent liability. It is a firm. It shall happen. The bank has the obligation, and it is not upon the request of the customer. Forward means a firm commitment. If it's on the request of the customer, we call it... Sorry? If it's upon request on the customer... On demand. Yeah, it, when, on demand, how do we call it? Uh, uh, option. 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 So, if the commitment is firm, we call it a futures or we call it an option. Oh, sorry, a forward. The difference between the futures and an option is that the futures is standardized with a very specific days, usually, you know, the day is going to be the last day of the month, with very specific amounts, usually $100,000 for one futures contract, $200,000 for two futures contract. In other words, each contract will be worth exactly $100,000. With a forward, it is highly customized to the date, to the size, and terms. In other words, the difference between futures and forwards is the degree of standardization where the futures are highly standardized, where the forwards are relatively customized. All right? So, when the bank will execute, of course, if the customer would need the futures, he won't do it with the bank. Why would he make a banker rich by paying him big fees when he can go and do it very inexpensively? on the futures exchange. There are very liquid futures exchanges where the contract could trade literally for 10, 15, 20 dollars. So you can buy a retail contract for 15, 20 dollars or buy contracts for 100 dollars. There is no need to pay a banker the amount. You would want to pay the banker the amount when the, you, need, you have a need that is significantly more customized than the service that the standard uh, futures contract will provide, all right? So the banker will be providing you a highly customized product because it may involve a lot of different features, and then you'd be paying him a fee, all right? Okay, that's pretty much it. What's again the forward contract? The forward contract is an arrangement that six months from today, we will make an exchange, currency exchange transaction. This is what I was looking for the last three or five months here in Saudi Arabia. A forward exchange rate? Yes, for the, with a forward exchange rate. And I was looking, in my own case, to make a forward contract with a commercial bank in Saudi Arabia where my Saudi salary, which comes in Saudi Riyal, that I will commit the bank for my June, July, and August salary when these salaries come, that the bank will exchange it, let's say, five Saudi Riyal for one euro. So that in case the dollar collapses, as it has been over the last couple of days, right, and I'm suffering significant losses on my salary, and because the dollar collapses and the Saudi Riyal is pegged to the dollar, and Saudi Riyal is pegged to the dollar, this means that when the dollar collapses, the real collapses at least against the other currencies like the euro, and suddenly my X amount of real, when I convert it back to euro, I'm suddenly suffering a three dollar three percent loss because the dollar collapsed in the last three days by three percent, for example. All right. So what I was looking to do is get a Saudi bank to commit that I can exchange, let's say five to one, whatever the current forward rate is, and that every month when I get my salary, they'll exchange it to euro at the fixed rate. Well, I can't go in on the exchange to do it with the futures because my salary is significantly smaller than the size of the standard contract. Standard contract is $100,000, uh, and my salary is unfortunately monthly salary significantly less than that. So I can't use 
uh, a futures contract. What I would need is a banker to lock in a borrowed exchange rate today for my salary coming three months so they from today. So the rate for you? No, uh, that's what I was hoping for, looking for. This is what the banker does with a forward currency forward. He will fix the rate for you today. Of course, the bank will hedge it up against either another one on the opposite, or they're going to go, when they get a significant exposure, they will go on the exchange. So they'll take, let's say, 25,000 real from me, they'll take 30,000 from me, they'll take 50,000 from you. When they get a significant exposure, let's say quarter or half a million real, they'll go and, you know, and they hedge it on the exchange, all right? For me, it may be 45 days, but on the exchange, they will hedge it for 60. In other words, they will be assuming certain currency risk, a small one, and when the risk exceeds a certain threshold, they'll go on the market and hedge it on the exchange, uh, on the futures market, all right? So they'll manage. And of course, they'll be collecting fees for those commitments. But that's, the point is, that's a commitment to execute in the future, it is not a transaction today. There is no cash flow or anything, so there is no real accounting record today. It is therefore off balance sheet, and that's the key idea. And the last one is uh, how they call them swap. How they call them swap contracts. So. Swap is defined as an exchange of fixed one. Rate, fixed no. An exchange of one cash flow for another cash flow. That's it. This is the definition. Because you're beginning to tell me about interest rate swaps. Um, yes. But the point is, there are 10, 15, different types of swaps, all right? So uh, when I get to teach uh, occasionally derivatives, the third part of the course, the first part is futures, the second part is options, the third part is swaps, you get a number of chapters in great details, all sorts of swaps. Well, you do have currency swaps. I mean, I don't want to get into, you know, teaching 15 or 20 different types of swaps. You do this in financial instruments, all right? But right now we are... We did it actually, investment. we did in interest, okay. interest, interest rate swaps. Yeah. Oh, so you did mostly interest rate swaps. So and futures interest, and forwards. Yeah, futures, forwards, interest rate swaps. In an interest rate swap, typically, uh, there is a uh, floating interest cash flow fixed. for a fixed income, ca uh, a fixed interest cash flow and the one exchange for another and it could be thousand and one different fundamental economic reasons. What's a pure vanilla swap? Well again, is it the currency swap or is it an interest rate? I, I, swap? I always hear them saying pure vanilla. Well thing. pure vanilla usually means or plain vanilla is just plain called plain vanilla. mean is the simplest of all the simplest and the most straightforward. So we have Plain vanilla? What's the opposite of plain vanilla in English? Chocolate. <laughs> Mixed vanilla. Uh, plain uh, vanilla? The opposite, well, uh, <laughs> this refers to, no, not chocolate, refers to ice cream. Plain vanilla ice cream? The chocolate chip vanilla. Yeah, no, we call it in English, uh, <laughs> at least when you go to the ice cream stand, the Flavor. ice cream. Oh, flavor! Yeah. yeah! Is this a bonus point? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you tell me, Professor. <laughs> yeah, why not, right? Oh. <laughs> so, flavored. Flavored means it could be flavor of strawberries or blueberries or cherries or blueberries and strawberries or blueberries, strawberries and cherries. In other words, uh, plain vanilla will have no features whatsoever. And flavor will have one, two, or more features in a particular mixture. In other words, plain vanilla you can think as standard, the way that's the way to understand it, and flavored you can think of as spiced. 
Yes, as customized. <laughs> oh, you said customized? I heard spiced. <laughs> okay. All right, so interest rate swaps. You may also have currency swaps. And again, in all sorts of variations, which we call flavors or flavorings, all right? Again, I don't want to get, get into that. And with this, we are done with commercial banking. Uh -huh. yeah. It's recording.